Maney concludes by writing, Thomas John Watson Sr. lived a great American life. He started out poor, built a grand company, made millions of dollars, and changed the world. He did so despite magnificent flaws. Watson's strengths, though, were extreme. He was blessed with that rare charisma that inspires followers to actually love their leader. Watson lived for the company. He embodied it. Every ounce of his personal ambition was inseparable from his ambition for IBM. That was an excerpt from the book The Mavericks and His Machine chronicling the career and leadership of Thomas John Watson Sr., the subject of episode 27, and welcome back to Leaders, a podcast dedicated to exploring the best leaders this world has ever seen. Episode 27, we'll cover John uh, Thomas J. Watson Sr., and in reading through The Maverick and His Machine, also the Founders Podcast episode highlighting Watson, as well as a great PBS leadership series and the IBM website itself, we get to the early start of IBM and what Thomas J. Watson, who eventually passed along the company's leadership to his son, has a great backstory and one that is in depth with a strong leader that Thomas John Watson was, and who was he as a person, and how did he rise to create what we know today as IBM. And so that's what we will cover here on this episode, and really the leaders that we've studied have different backgrounds, uh, some engineers, some very technical, some from non-traditional areas that got vaulted into a CEO position and worked their way up as executives, some that started at the company many years before and worked their way up. And in other ways, there are other people that start as uh, salesmen. And that is the path that Thomas John Watson really had within his experience was he was deemed by some as the world's greatest salesman, as the media would would come to call him, taught a new generation of young professionals how to sell, a skill that would elevate the man himself from modest beginnings on a farm in Steuben County, New York, to the pinnacle of influence and prestige on the world stage. Nothing came easy, Watson would say of his early years, emphasizing how initiative and hard work pulled him out of early business setbacks and financial disadvantage. He never attended university, deciding instead to begin a hard-scrabble rural sales career where he developed an appreciation for the challenges and abilities of everyday people. These sort of bootstrap beginnings built his faith in human agency, a guiding principle of the company of IBM. He encoded this belief in a simple set of values that along with service to the customer and excellence in work would form the bedrock of its culture. Within a year of his arrival at CTR, in a 1915 talk with staff, he established the company's first priority, the respect and nourishing, nurturing of employees. This ethos, centered on people rather than products, persists at IBM to this day. And before IBM, he also was involved in the company National Cash Register. And National Cash Register was sort of the Microsoft of its day with a monopoly hold on the market. NCR built their products to last, and they did. Smaller independent operators found a lucrative niche in refurbishing used machines and selling them to the smaller businesses that could not afford the new machines. NCR's president and founder, John Patterson, who we will hear a little bit more about later from a mentor's standpoint that Thomas looked to, hated the idea that any other company might make money from his machines, so he created a sham organization with Watson at the helm to deal in used machines, funded and controlled by NCR with its sole purpose, the elimination of NCR's competitors. It had the resources to pay higher prices for used machines and then sell them at lower prices. 
the company ruined virtually every one of its competitors. Watson ran the division successfully without thinking about either the legal or moral ramifications of his or the company's actions until the federal government caught up with NCR and indicted the company and its top officers. Uh, All those officers, including Watson, were convicted. So definitely a stronghold on succeeding at whatever costs. Uh, One example of which those early days illustrated there, he was centered and put into the limelight and media as that world's greatest salesman, also deemed possibly, and Lee Iacocca, I think, had some of this as well, but he was almost deemed as a celebrity sort of CEO figure. Uh, He was in the news and media a lot, and just the way that he sold the company as well as himself um, definitely went over well with the public, the employees, and everyone sort of involved from that right. So... Let's get into more, now that we have a little bit of background on Thomas J. Watson uh, and some of the, the things that he did in the lead-up of to IBM, let's go into his leadership style a little bit more here. And so IBM really came to rule the information technology market under his, what we can deem, kind of paternalistic leadership style. He served as president for 42 years, from 1912 uh, up until the mid fifties, he really he was not a scientist or an inventor, but through his leadership, he pushed the world of information processing into the mainstream, and set the stage for the digital revolution that ultimately transformed the planet. He did have a unique hands-on leadership uh, approach and skills that created a culture of research, innovation, and success that's still maintained at IBM, according to a story told by management guru Peter Drucker, Peter Drucker, when the Japanese looked to America for business to emulate as they sought to rebuild their economy. After World War II, the choice was obvious. IBM, the most successful company in the world at the time. And more of on Watson's philosophy. So he developed <clears throat> a lot of his management style and corporate culture from John Henry Patterson's national cash register, formalized training, Watson, again, had strong sales backgrounds, so this is in parallel, I think, to some of the the others that we've studied from a leader's standpoint. Uh, John Chambers comes to mind at Cisco. He was a salesman. Um, uh, many of these other leaders uh, had a skill set of, in a sense, selling, and that proves to go well for Watson from a results standpoint and how he can build up IBM. And he even says one of his hobbies is he collects salesmen. So he's always in that sales frame, salesman mind frame. And some words that I think define more of his philosophy is that the customer is the most important visitor on our premises. He is not dependent on us. We are dependent on him. He is not an interruption of our work. He is the purpose of it. He is not an insider. He is part of it. We do not do him a favor by serving him. He does us a favor by giving us the opportunity to do so. His dedication to instilling these values in his sales team was instrumental in their growth and global dominance. Another quality that he mentions as being important is a high level of trust. So he says, follow the path of the unsafe, independent thinker. Expose your ideas to the danger of controversy. Speak your mind and fear less the label of crackpot than the stigma of conformity. His sales training programs were groundbreaking in their approach. They went beyond the traditional focus on technical knowledge and covered effective communication and relationship building. Watson knew that the most successful salespeople could connect personally with their clients. By teaching his team to understand customer needs and establishing meaningful relationships, he empowered them to become not just sales reps, but trusted advisors. One of his key insights was that sales isn't just about transactions. It's about building long-lasting partnerships. He also emphasized the importance of trust and integrity in every interaction that they made. 
And that was rooted in the belief that when clients trust their salespeople, they're more likely to make long-term commitments. This approach not only enhanced their reputation, but also set a standard for ethical sales practices that continue to inspire them today. He's also a relentless advocate for learning from mistakes. His stoic statement, would you like me to give you a formula for success? It's quite simple, really. The way to succeed is to double your error rate. So part of that error rate and doubling it is obviously taking on some risk. You develop the trust, but then you also do take, take on risk. And so I think we've mentioned this in a last last few episodes, but the idea of inverting uh, is, is pronounced in Charlie Munger's uh, works and studies. And so Charlie always says, invert, always invert. And one story to illustrate this from Thomas Watson to to really embody that would be the bold thinking of Watson occurred really at the start of the Great Depression time frame. So instead of laying off employees when demand plummeted, which, you know, pretty much any other company at this time is sort of forced to do that, he continued manufacturing calculating machines, banking on an eventual economic turnaround. This risky move enabled IBM to have ample inventory when the inventory when the economy shifted. As a result, he sec- secured substantial contracts through FDR's New Deal and the inception of the Social Security program. So think about this, Watson during the Great Depression, he managed to increase employment, decrease weekly working hours and still increase the average annual wage of his employees. He was really a firm believer that sales can fix anything. And at this time, you know, this is not going to be a popular decision by any means. And really, within the people that were close to him, everyone was really questioning this to say, hmm, what is he doing here? Uh, The board of directors and peers really questioned, like, have you gone insane here? His sanity, the ego, kind of the overconfidence of like, no, this will rebound. Like, I know what I'm doing. Trust me type of approach. Uh, So many people were doubting what he was doing there. Uh, And he was kind of described by some as a result of really being uh, self-absorbed, overconfident. Um, But he did really believe in that. And his actions backed up his words in that right. And another few things that he focused on was research and development. And so he thought that research and development would drive sales. So he ended up building a lab and an IBM training and sales school, which was kind of the first of its kind within the industry. And some other companies would go on to kind of emulate a similar sort of framework. He thought that investing in education was a great investment and one that he wanted to do in excess over many of the other companies before him. He also, by some, was deemed sort of a micromanager. So Watson insisted of a salesman call on customers on a regular basis, log onto those punch cards, analyze them, provide info back to engineers as to which products to build. So he, in some sense, really had a pioneering mindset in that right in that he wanted to study and log every interaction that we see through modern kind of CRM systems now he was or he was doing that back in the uh, 40s and 50s to understand you know where are the sales going uh, where are they coming from and what should we be doing differently and what products should we be building based on this feedback from customers that his engineers could work on so the engineering uh, product cycle and uh, just collection and an- analyzing data from the customer standpoint was something that um, he was probably one of the first ones to do at a company level of that, right? So he was definitely ahead of his time. In regards to that, one of the other kind of uh, philosophies that he had was that world peace through world trade was something that Uh, he wanted to embody so he aggressively pursued international trade in the 30s and 40s extending the company's hold over the global business machines industry he employed locals as managers set lofty goals and helped countries build their economies while imparting the same standards and values he'd instill in the u.s 
1949, he formed the World Trade Corporation to focus the company's international expansion efforts. In 1975, foreign sales overtook U.S. revenues. For Watson, international commerce served his broader goal of promoting world peace. We have organizations in 79 countries, he would say, practically all the countries of the world, and when we are able to maintain peace and cooperation among our people, it seems to me that the same could be accomplished among nations, he said in 1939. So kind of a overarching uh, principle that he wanted his actions again to mirror and adopt that within IBM to the extent that he could. He also, like we had mentioned, uh, develops these schools, develops these kind of sales and education. So definitely a focus on the overarching topic of education and in return for the ins institution's ultimate regard. Watson expected something of his employees. He would repeatedly urge IBMers to think, and we will hear about that slogan uh, here in a little bit, but he, it was a rallying cry he brought with permission from the National Cash Register Company where he'd spent more than a decade honing his sales skills, that single word would grow into a mantra, both to encourage creativity and to inspire excellence. Found its way into offices, even beyond IBM, onto the stationery, and eventually onto the highly successful laptop they develop, the ThinkPad. Productive thinking, Watson recognized, required development. So under his leadership, the company invested heavily in that employee education Soon after he arrived in 1914, he instructed staff to open an on-site business library. In 1918, 70 managers enrolled in the first executive training program. In 1932, he opened the IBM Schoolhouse to provide employees education and training. Today, the company uh, spends hundreds of millions of dollars annually to educate IBMers. He does say education is the advance guard of progress, and it is, it is to education that we must look for the conception and carrying through of all progressive and constructive movements. So more on that slogan of IBM, the simple word think. So Watson began using think to motivate or inspire staff while at NCR and continued to use it at, an, at CTR. International Business Machines, IBM's first U.S. trademark, was for the name Think, filed as a U.S. trademark on June 6, 1935, with the description Periodical Publications. The trademark was filed 14 years before the company filed for a U.S. trademark on the name IBM. A biographical article in 1940 noted that this word is on the most conspicuous wall of every room at every IBM building. Each employee carries a think notebook in which to record inspirations. The company stationary matches, scratch pads all bear the inscription think. A monthly magazine called Think is distributed to the employees as well. It remains a part of their cor corporate culture and also the inspiration again by that IBM ThinkPad. And so he's trying to build, in a sense, some would call like kind of a religion or cult-like sort of company within all these different uh, sort of cultural sayings and philosophies, principles, that sort of thing. Uh, he did, in a sense, as we alluded to before, ha kind of have a monopoly control within that these kind of tabulating machines market. He did have... Uh, the machine basically with all the kind of IP on it. So it was really hard for uh, competitors to move into the space and replicate that. He was kind of a big thinker and optimist. And like Henry Ford, I think that we've studied back in episode six, he took some uh, actions towards also valuing the employees. So uh, women in IBM's workforce significantly increased in during World War II. Female workers assumed roles in factories, office settings, management, including the position. As high up as VP of Human Resources, he paid his employees well and offered a progressive slate of benefits. In 1934, the company moved all of its manufacturing employees from piecework pay to hourly wages. His cradle's grave culture fostered deep sort of loyalty amongst his staff. 
this kind of global vision that we, he said um, before, global peace through global trade, they expanded globally as a result of that. He had really a vision for them being an international company, establishing presence in numerous companies. He valued innovation as well, so encouraging teams to embrace change, understanding the importance of adapting to evolving technologies and market demands. In some right, uh, part of his leadership style was also described as authoritarian, so he had a strong presence and really known for making decisive decisions. While this style uh, could be demanding, it also contributed to the efficiency and success of, of IBM during his tenure. You know, at the time that he departs IBM, he does transition the company to his son. So Tom Watson Jr. becomes CEO after that. And really his his mark uh, from the culture standpoint and what we've talked about is definitely part of his legacy. But the results also speak for themselves in that he did achieve a 255x increase in employees and a 100x increase in revenues uh, in his 40 plus years at the uh, IBM president uh, helm. So that covers off on uh, some leadership principles there. Let's go into a little bit more about uh, some of the failures and challenges that he also encountered. So through the time that he was president, there were some trying times just in the the international and world history of, of what he's dealing with. So one event being obviously the Great Depression, but they, they sort of handled that, I think, much better than what most companies did in that, right? So he managed to steer them through that difficult time, really focusing on innovation, sales, international expansion. Uh, tabulating machine company. So before he founded IBM, he worked at, as we mentioned, NCR. He left NCR after a dispute with management, and later he joined uh, CTR, which we mentioned, Computing Tabulating Recording Company, which eventually became IBM. There were definitely challenges and conflicts during that kind of transition period, though. Antitrust becomes sort of an issue as well. So in 1932, the U.S. government filed an antitrust against IBM, accusing them of those monopolistic practices. The case dragged on for several years, and IBM eventually settled in 1936. The settlement required IBM to limit its business practices and provide licenses for its punch card technology to other companies. IBM during this time frame too also goes through World War II and the Holocaust, so their punch card technology was used during the, the war and there's been some historical discussions about their involvement in providing that also to the Germans. So some critics argue uh, that technology could be facilitated through you know, what we know today th with the Germans and the Holocaust. So controversial aspect of their history, although the extent of Watson's sort of personal knowledge and involvement remains a topic of debate, debate from that time frame. Uh, success in succession challenges too um, within this too. So he faced challenges he did have the appointment of his son, and there were tensions and disagreements with that as a successor. He eventually passed it on, though, to his son, who, you know, IBM today is a little bit different than what we may know it uh, from when Watson Sr. was running it, but um, certainly a not a horrible sort of succession uh, plan as we've seen through some other uh, companies here that have had challenges with that, you know, GE with Jack Welch and uh, to Jeff Immelt, that sort of um, approach. So let's close things out here with wrapping up those challenges and going into some of the, the mentors and heroes. So there are some figures, really three key figures that he mentions as mentors along his way. One being uh, Watson brought with him the best ideas he had seen John Patterson implement at NCR, so including Patterson's obsession with culture. Watson wasted no time in creating the foundation for the culture that made IBM famous. He urged his men to dress in a style similar to the customers they called upon. He instituted sales quotas and c contests. His meetings with his sales staff took on the air 
of revivals, Maney ends each chapter with lyrics from the many songs written in homage to Mr. Watson. Charles Kettering, GM. So Watson had been profoundly influenced by Charles Kettering, the brilliant engineer responsible for mo- much of GM's most important innovations. Watson met Kettering when they were both young men beginning their careers at NCR in Dayton. It was Kettering who instilled in Watson both an understanding of and an appreciation for the importance of research and development in any organization. Watson believed that R&D would drive sales. It was his passion for technological improvements that eventually prompted him to build what became uh, IBM's famous laboratory. And then finally here, George F. Johnson. He was a very different kind of manager than Patterson, so he was the leader of the Endicott Johnson Shoe Company. And Johnson made a huge impression on Watson and convinced him to keep CTR in the region. He was also known for implementing progressive and employee-friendly policies at NCR, such as profit sharing and an emphasis on employee welfare. And those policies may have influenced Watson's view on management practices and the importance of employee satisfaction. So with that, uh, that should be a a wrap here on episode 27, covering off on uh, Thomas Watson Sr., uh, the founder of and president for a long time of IBM, uh, a a legacy company that still succeeds today and definitely one of which uh, a salesman at heart, but definitely harnesses that that sales background into training and enabling his employees to succeed in that right and really had IBM start off on the right foot and really develop a sort of narrow market into tabulating machines that then under his leadership really grew to a large business and one that still again is around today. So with that, we will wrap up episode 27 and be back here with episode 28 here soon. Thanks.